Hello there. Today's review is about a very popular book, The Unbound Flight. Let's find out if this novel soars high or if it was doomed from the start. Where should I start reading? What is canon versus legends? When does the story begin? The answers to these questions is right here on Star Wars Timeline. The Outbound Flight is a very talked about and popular book written by Timothy Zahn and released in January of 2006. Sorry guys, I don't have my book on hand. It's sitting there on the shelf and it was too far to dig into. But I just wanted to quickly mention that the cover illustration is by AJ Kimball and I think he did a wonderful job. On the flip side of the novel, you will also see Younger Thrawn and I'll pop the picture on the screen so you can check out what the cover looks like. In terms of timeline, this is a Legends novel written in before the Disney era and it, the story takes place 27 years before Battle of Yavin or before Episode 4. Um, this story doesn't necessarily clash or negate what happens in the new Throne novel released in April of 2017 from the Disney era, which is part of the new canon. And the story there takes place from 13 to 11 years BBY, which is much later. So it's interesting how you could basically consider both novels uh, part of a greater Throne's story. Now, before we jump into talking about this book, two things I'd like to mention. If you enjoy this content, I do tons of uh, Star Wars book and comic book reviews. Please consider subscribing. Your help would really mean a lot to me. And the second thing is, this is going to be a full-on spoiler review. I have my notes in front of me. I want to talk about characters, plot, and so forth. So if you haven't read this book before, my strong recommendation would be to go and check it out for yourself, form your own opinion, and then try to come back and see what I think about it. Maybe we can discuss it, you'll leave a comment, and I would love to hear your thoughts. Without further ado, let's jump into it. Let me first give you a quick synopsis of what happens in the outbound flight as a refresher. Um, in the beginning of it, this is before the clone era, we have a noble voyage in this outbound flight. It's a big project, uh, which is uh, handled by Joris Sebayoth, uh, one of the Jedi Grandmasters who is uh, uh, pushing for this project. And what it's trying to accomplish is to explore and colonize uh, undiscovered worlds beyond the known regions or beyond the known galaxy. Basically, it's trying to go into extra stellar, extra uh, uh, galactic uh, travel. And on board of it, there are 18 Jedi, including apprentices, Jedi Knights, as well as masters, with 50,000 colonists on board. Um, we know from this novel that secretly behind this on the surface adventure, it is being orchestrated by no other than uh, uh, Darth Sidious, and he has ulterior plans for this uh, project. And it's doomed from the start because we understand that the uh, future emperor wants to send these Jedi away, and he wants to get rid of as many of them as possible, and for the people, for the Republic, not to dwell too much on what's happening beyond, and it's a whole different story to it. So the the flight travels to the as far as the unknown regions of space where it encounters the new alien species of chiss and the chiss ascendancy um unfortunately for the members on board of the ship uh they become unwilling prize for the warring factions in that unknown uh, territory and its its uh, rivals who are, who are vying for power there and eventually by the end of the book the the uh, ship is, is destroyed with certain parties accomplishing what they wanted exactly out of this doomed project. Now let me talk about specific things and characters and story elements that I thought worked or didn't work, and I'll give you my impression and reasoning why, and give this novel my final score at the end. So the first thing I really want to touch about is that what is the main attraction of this novel? Uh, for those of us who read previous Star Wars books, of course, the biggest uh, interest was Thrawn himself, and Joris Sebayoth. Both of these are pillars of the original Timothy uh, Zahn's uh, Throne trilogy written in the early 90s, which are, of course, uh, legendary novels. And a lot of great story threads and characters originate in those books, which become much uh, more important later on in Star Wars lore. But those two I would like to focus on, Joris Sebayoth and Admiral Thrawn. Uh, who are these characters? And let's compare them to the um, original Throne Trilogy book, which I think without it, talking about this book would not mean make much sense because it's honestly an extension of the original Throne Trilogy. Um, 
So let's start with Admiral Thrawn. In the original Thrawn trilogy, uh, the first book called Heir to the Empire, he is this genius military strategist and uh, uh, imperial, one of the few imperial uh, admirals who is not a human being, he's alien, because, you know, the Empire supposedly has uh, uh, prejudice versus other species. And he arrives after the episode six, after the second Death Star is destroyed and Emperor Palpatine is, and the Vader are gone. And he is there coming back from the unknown regions of space and he wants to set order back to the galaxy. He wants to take over and proclaim himself, you know, the a new custodian of the uh, restored empire. And who is uh, Joris Sebayath? Joris Sebayath is also one of the most important characters in the original Throne trilogy, who is this deranged, crazy Jedi clone of the original Joris Sebayath, who we see in this Unbind Flight novel. And in the original uh, 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 Timothy Zahn's trilogy, he is a clone. And because of that, he's crazy, he's deranged, he doesn't have recollection of memory of who he used to be. The only thing that he understands and knows is that he's supposed to protect the Emperor's secret on this hidden planet and hidden fortress of the Wayland. And uh, of course, uh, once he encounters uh, Luke and Leia, and Leia's about uh, with a young uh, uh, Jedi children, Sebayath wants them. So he, he has this crazy Jedi who has a compulsion and mu not much else goes beyond there. Um, so to make the first point about the outbound flight, I would like to argue that Thrawn doesn't evolve in this book. From the beginning that we meet him to the end of the book, he is driven by one single thing. He wants to protect his own people, the Chiss Ascendancy. He wants to make sure this part of the uh, unknown regions of space is not occupied by any rivaling parties or that uh, the Republic doesn't snoop around because apparently the Chiss Ascendancy seems to know a bit more about the outsiders, the central part of this galaxy, than the Republic knows about the Chiss. And that's how he tends uh, for things to remain. And beyond that point, other than the fact that he's willing to go at any length and do whatever is necessary to accomplish his goal, he remains the same dude throughout the whole book. And for me, it felt quite flat and uninteresting because Compared to the Thrawn that we meet for the first time in Thrawn's trilogy, he's clearly a villain. He's clearly ambitious to restore and take possession of the Empire. And here, between these two characters, there is not even an um, allusion to or evolution of the younger uh, Thrawn from the Alban fight, who will eventually become the cynical, villainous uh, uh, general who uh, uh, is a complete and true believer of the Empire. Um, I felt that there was no really no incentive for him in the Alban flight to trust the Republic and to trust Darth Sidious, who ha has a brief communication with him in the Alban flight, and they exchange a couple of words. But really, beyond that small scene, there is no incentive for Thrawn to begin to prepare and start making plans of him entering the Republic, employing himself in the service of the Emperor, and becoming its loyal servant. Um, I saw no connection whatsoever. Um, another thing, as I mentioned before, is that here in the Alban flight, Thrawn feels like a good guy. You know, he's trying to do right by his people. And, you know, he's noble. He accepts the uh, uh, passengers, the people, George Cardas and his party, which I'll mention a little bit later. Uh, 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 members of the Republic who, uh, in the beginning of the novel, accidentally end up in the unknown regions of space. You know, uh, 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 Thrawn accepts them and he embraces them as friends. He starts showing them around. And I didn't quite understand that I'm reading about the same kind of Thrawn. There is no beginning of the villain there. He's through and through a good guy. Um, and uh, the next uh, thing that I'd like to mention is actually the three people that end up in his custody. They're basically George Cardas, a young pilot who employs himself with two other friends, uh, a female named Maurice and the captain ship pilot Dubrock. So these three people, this first party, uh, are the first sort of to stumble upon or come across the Chiss and Thrawn because they're escaping from their pursuers and they end up in the unknown regions of space and Thrawn is the one to pick them up. And when he does that, he starts, obviously he's curious about them. It would kind of make sense that a, a military strat a strategist would want to learn as much as possible about his potential enemies or friends. He doesn't know who they are. 
But I, I sort of enjoyed that part where he's trying to learn their language and vice versa. But I felt there was no rhyme or reason of why Thrawn should trust the civilians and especially bring them on board of his military vessel into the uh, uh, on the deck and show them around. And later on, when they're engaged in military operations throughout the action scenes in the novel, they're always present there, especially George Cardas. I can understand that uh, Thrawn would groom one of them, one of the most gullible or perhaps trustworthy uh, members of this group and say, well, okay, let me bring this kid into the fall, George Cardas, and exactly what happens, and learn from him. But he honestly treats uh, uh, the younger man as an equal and a friend and bestows upon him, you know, all these secrets of the Chiss Ascendancy, which to me, the novel, if anything else, signals that they're this very secretive and very uh, uh, isolated species, and they don't, they don't like anybody snoopering around. So that didn't make much sense. Um, in terms of the Chiss Ascendancy itself, the species which is a throne is a, a member of, uh, there was this great setup that there will be a very alluring and mysterious uh, alien race that we first encounter in this novel. They obviously show up much later in Star Wars Legends books, and we see a lot more Chiss happening there, and they, they become more involved with the, um, the New Republic and you know the new fight against their Imperial Remnant. But the problem is here that once the the young, the three young people, three friends, George Cardas, Maurice, and Dubrak, encounter them. And later on, other parties, including the outbound flight, start making that first contact with the Chiss. They're not really that much different. They're like blue humans, uh, uh, you know, human beings with blue skin, and they are obviously have a slightly different culture or beliefs. But beyond that, they felt like, okay, Chiss is just sort of there. And that set up for the great maybe differences of culture or complete different perceptions on outlook on, on life in general or how to inter physically interact with one another. None of it was there. So to me, it was a kind of downer that the Chiss ended up being just another blue-looking humans in space. Now, the second big, big part of the Outbound flight that I would like to talk about, perhaps even bigger than Thrawn, is Joris Sebayoth. And the reason that I say that he's bigger, because I want to make a comparison between him in the Outbound flight and the Joris Sebayoth, spelled a little bit differently from the original Thrawn trilogy. And the reason I say this is that in the original Thrawn trilogy, he's the one who is on par or with Thrawn in terms of how much time he has uh, uh, in uh, uh, that trilogy and how much story is dedicated to him. So he was very, very important, I felt, in this book because we, we would see how the original Jedi Master is killed off, perhaps, and how uh, Emperor Palpatine gets access to his DNA somehow to clone him. Because that's who we see in the original Throne trilogy. We see the clone, a carbon copy version of Joris Sebayoth. And I felt the two are completely incompatible here. And let me give you reasons why, why I think he didn't work in the Albon flight and he works much better in the original Thrawn trilogy. So in the beginning of the Albon flight, we see that uh, Joris Sebayas, the original guy, he's already too arrogant to be a Jedi Master. I really don't understand how Timothy Zahn tried to portray him and throw him in there. Yes, we sort of understand from the prequel trilogy of films that the Jedi had their hubris and perhaps they weren't looking in the right direction and too absorbed with their ritual and observing all the rules. And that's why the uh, Palpatine was able to outsmart them. But I don't believe for a second that the Jedi Order with illustrious Jedi like Yoda and Mace Windu and Ki Adimundi on the council would permit for such a Jedi master as Joris Sebayoth to be on there, much less uh, to be uh, uh, on the council. He would never be a Jedi in their eyes. And throughout the course of the outbound fight novel, he, I felt that he falls to the dark side way too fast. He's almost like a childlike persona with these tantrums that all other Jedi masters seem to ignore. And it just honestly wasn't very believable. Um, and I felt in the beginning of the novel, when Joris Sebayoth is proposing this Alban flying project, which seems like a, a noble idea, you know, they want to go explore. And he wants to be the one who is in charge, once again, showing his arrogance. Uh, in order to, for his uh, mission to go forward, he has this conversation encounter with uh, Chancellor Palpatine, and he's sent to resolve a mining strike dispute on a planet called Balrog. 
where he encounters Obi-Wan Kenobi, younger Anakin. It sort of was an interesting interaction where the original Joris Sebayas sees younger, eager uh, 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 Anakin Skywalker. And later on, when we get to the original Throne uh, trilogy, we see a co copy of the Joris Sebayas. And who does he gravitate to? He gravitates towards the children of Anakin Skywalker, who are Luke and Leia uh, Skywalker, as well as Leia's uh, 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 twins. So that sort of connection was the only one which I was able to build like a mental bridge and say, oh, I, I see what he's doing here. Okay, that's fine. But beyond that point, I felt that Sebaya's uh, 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 a mission on Barlak was a complete distraction from the novel. It was not necessary. Um, I felt that it didn't need to be there to show uh, uh, Sebaya's progression towards the dark side because he does that in the main uh, part of the story itself when he's already boards the Alban flight uh, spaceship itself. So I felt it was really confusing. That first part of the novel, I felt, really did a disservice to the pacing of it. And I felt that it was, you could do without it. Um, and uh, uh, another thing I would like to mention is that the difference between the Jedi Master who's turning to the dark side versus the crazy Force-sensitive clone that we see in uh, uh, Timothy Zahn's original Thrawn trilogy. So here we understand that in the Alban flight and, you know, the Jedi Order not being exactly what they were supposed to be, Joris Sebayas is quickly turning into this baby who is making this little fit, fits and tantrums just because uh, people are not willing to give him enough power. And even during the course of the album flying, when he tries to make important calls and shots and strategic, uh, 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 you know, uh, things, he always comes off as a baby. And he always bangs on the table. And for some strange reason, all the Jedi just react. I'm like, oh, okay, Master. Because we understand that unless you're on the Jedi Council and even Council members, they don't have this kind of authority over other Jedi Masters. It's more of a kind of democratic, almost like Senate of, of the Jedi. But here, he, uh, uh, Sabayat, very quickly gets comfortable with his position, and he has no problem whatsoever imposing his uh, uh, rules, and nobody else questions him. I felt that was really weak and not really consistent, even with the prequel version of the Jedi, which portrays that are, they're not perfect. Um, versus the Sabayat that we see in the original Throne trilogy. Now, there he's a much more interesting, but very one-dimensional character basically what he is he is a clone of a jedi master and according to legends books we understand that cloning force sensitive beings turned out to be a failed attempt it was impossible and one of the first instances of that is joris sebayath from that trilogy because by the time luke encounters him and he meets him you know that person has some kind of faculty of who he is he can carry a conversation yes and he demonstrates immense force powers but he's crazy because of that, not because of the original Joris Sebayat, who has this ego and he's an egomaniac and he just wants people to follow him. So there's a very clear distinction of the crazy Joris Sebayat from the original Throne trilogy versus a Jedi Master who for some reason gets his way every time because he's Joris Sebayat and there's really no explanation to it. So... And the last thing that kind of like dro drove the nail in the coffin for me in, in regards to this novel, I'm pretty sure you understand where I'm heading with my impression of it. The book ends up in a very abrupt manner. Perhaps there were plans to release more uh, 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 Alban Fly books, but it was released in 2006, way before the earliest Star Wars books were called Legends and set aside. This is in 2006, and until 2015, I felt there were probably perhaps way more opportunities to release out other outbound flying books, perhaps a trilogy, explaining more what happens. We don't, we don't get any of it here. Um, the lost colonists on a crashed uh, outbound flying ship, we don't know exactly what their fate is. We kind of get a hint of an idea. Timothy Zahn gives us like a, a, he throws us the bone and tells us this and narratively that, oh, there's enough food to kind of like for them to maintain themselves and uh, planetoid where the ship crash lands you know there's it possibly it is habitable but that's not enough and the people that die on board of that ship including a jedi 
Knight and no other than Thrawn's brother as well. Again, nothing there for those characters is resolved. Emotionally, their arc doesn't complete. The novel just ends as if there were supposed to be some sort of sequel and it never comes to be. Um, nothing really happens with Thrawn. Okay, he accomplishes off this outbound flight to be lost and no other rivaling faction in the unknown regions of space gets a hold of it. So I guess it's sort of a small victory, but it doesn't perpetuate Thrawn's plans and it doesn't build a connection to the Emperor Palpatine and why uh, Admiral Thrawn in the future would become such a devout follower of the Empire and believe in its version of the Order. None of it is here, once again. Um, the only good parts that I would like to mention that kind of like struck me and I was paying attention to throughout the entire book are the two side characters, really, the supporting cast. One of them is George Cardas, the youngest member of these three first humans that arrive. He was kind of interesting, you know, and he was trying to kind of like, he's torn between two loyalties to his friends and also to the throne. And then when he sees the Alba in flight with 50,000 innocent people on board, he tries to please all three parties and he's torn between them because you feel like deep inside <clears throat> he is... Uh, uh, um, a compassionate person, but later on will become something else that we see further in, in uh, uh, future uh, Legends novels. And I thought that Palpatine's henchman, uh, Kim Mandoriana, was the most interesting part of this novel because he, in essence, is Palpatine. He, he furthers Palpatine's plans. He demonstrates some cunning. He is a step ahead out of, uh, uh, you know, compared to the Jedi and Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin, and he knows how to inject himself in. He controls the Nimodian uh, uh, um, guy over there, the, the counselor, I forget exactly who he was, but um, the Do Doriana is the one who is always in control. He gets mission accomplished, and honestly, by the end of the Alban flight novel, he's the one who can claim the only victory here and say, like, okay, this is what the... Uh, uh, Emperor Palpatine uh, uh, tasked me with and mission accomplished and here we go. So in closing, what, what are my impressions of this book and what score I would give it? Honestly, this is my first book on this channel where I would give it 2.53, no more than that. I honestly, I did not like this book and partially is because I probably set myself up to high expectations, which I try not to do, but the instance of the outbound flight, it was very, very hard to do. And I'll explain why. This book was advertised back in 2006 as something that another great adventure, perhaps the genesis of the Admiral Thrawn, that we know is a great villain in the original Thrawn trilogy. And I sort of regret not reading it back then, but I don't know <clears throat> if my opinion back then would have been any different to what it is today. I just finished it a couple of days ago because I also have read uh, the original Thrawn trilogy way before 2006 and I knew uh, uh, who Thrawn is, I knew who Joris Sabayoth is and coming into this novel who also, which also features these prominent characters, it's inescapable. You have certain expectations and you would like to see a common thread tying in the two works together because they come from the same mind, from the same creator. Now, in terms of the prose of the novel, it's competently written. I think Timothy Zahn had certain ideas that he wanted to execute here. The, that I believe that ideas are clear enough, but they never come to fruition. And perhaps this sounds a little bit harsh, and I love Timothy Zahn, I love his novels. It feels like he phoned this book in. It feels uninspired. It feels like... Perhaps in the beginning, he was excited to return to this character and he kind of felt that, ah, you know, I killed him off in the original Throne trilogy. And then we have another Hand of Throne uh, duology coming out several later uh, years later, which he toys uh, around with the idea of bringing back Throne, but it's not really Throne. And then it, it's done in a very effective manner without cheapening the experience and without just resurrecting uh, Throne. So here... Zahn had a perfect opportunity to revisit the character and show us who Thrawn and Joris Sebayath would become, but unfortunately it doesn't happen. So once again, most likely I would give it 2.5, no more than that. I 
did not much enjoy this book aside from a couple of supporting characters and that's about it but I would like to hear what you guys think about it did you read the book recently have you read it when it just came out and how was your overall impression back then and has it evolved uh, since then once again my name is Benjamin I do Star Wars comic book and book reviews character highlights lore videos I have my own podcast if you enjoyed this video please consider supporting me you know hit that bell button subscribe to my channel and I would really appreciate your support I'll see you later